Hello and welcome to In Search of Purpose with Sal Hamley. Hello and welcome to this podcast with Sal Hamby in search of purpose. Today I have the great pleasure of um, inviting into the podcast virtual studio Frank Liddy or aka as I like to call him Frankie. Hello Frankie, how are you today? Hi Sal, great, great to see you and what a beautiful day. It is a beautiful day, it's about 16 degrees out there already and it's, it's probably going to climb which is just lovely and if people can get out for a little bit um, and be sensible about it. Uh, get the forearms out because that's how you get the vitamin D into the system is through the forearms the quickest. Really? That's why oh. yeah, that's why you're um, yeah, you uh, tan quickest on your forearm because oh. it's um, the quickest way of getting vitamin D into the system. But don't wash your arms for about eight hours after because you're actually wiping away a lot of the D3, which is essentially trying to convert into the system. There you go. <laughs> That's my nutrition um, information coming out at you there. So Frankie, today I am so happy to be having you on because I've, I've been wanting to ask some lovely questions for quite some time and I'm sure a lot of people out there would like to know a lot about what it is that you do. Um, to me, you're the, the meditation guru. Um, you're the person to go to for advice, insight, guidance, knowledge. I did a course with you once at Queen's University uh, in mindfulness, which was fantastic. I did that with my mum and it was really good. And I've, you know, I've, I've dabbled into meditation here, there and everywhere at different times over the years. I've done retreats, I've done Zazen, Japanese meditation retreats and so on. And I just would like to, first of all, start by asking you, what inspired you to start meditating? Very good question, and I've been asked that question a few times. And the more I'm asked that question, which is a great question, you know, you know, I discover within myself and I recover within myself as to why or how it all began. And going way back to uh, the days of old, you know, during the troubles, I remember way back then that I came across a great man uh, uh, up in a place called Ben Burb. Uh, Ian McCreeve is his name, and Ian McCreeve was the daddy of trauma back in the 70s. Nobody at Belfast talked about trauma. And then what happened was through another great man called Tim Chapman, who was a probation officer, uh, and I was working on a probation outreach project. So what happened was Tim got some funding for me to do some training at Queen's, and I was introduced to Ian McCreeve. And whenever I was with Ian McCreeve, this is back in the 70s, whenever I was with Ian McCreeve, then Ian McCreeve introduced me to the work of a guy called Basil van der Kock, who wrote an amazing book called The Body Keeps the Score. Mm -hmm. And van der Kock talked about mindfulness. So whenever I brought that to the attention of Eamon and asked Eamon, what's mindfulness? And this is back in the 70s. <clears throat> and I asked Eamon, I said, what's, what's mindfulness? He said, I don't know, but go and find out. And that's, that, that was it. That was then, and this is now. And I'm still friend of that. And I suppose mindfulness has become almost coffee table psychology with regards to its newness in, in comparison to something that obviously you've been practicing for a very, very long time. So when this term became hip and popular, you thought, I've been there, done that, been doing it for so long. But yeah, let's continue to learn rather than sort of discard it as some nuance so that's humble of you um, but at the same time um, isn't Jean Kabat-Zinn quite responsible for the mind, mindfulness theory? Yes indeed John would be John would be and I had a great uh, pleasure and an honour to meet up with John Did and you? done some work with John oh yes uh, over in London but uh, and John would be another a great friend of mine mate uh, and yours Paul Holler uh, yeah. from San Francisco yeah. Centre uh, so yes no, John would be the daddy of mindfulness in the west you know he'd be the man who brought it into the secular world and which is also known today as the third wave in psychology yeah but john and basil van der would be also very close hmm. yeah well i really really like a lot of his body scan work you know for people who don't really get into the sort of as more the the hardcore med meditation of you know really kind of pushing the boundaries of of um silence with it 
um, where maybe start with some guided work in order to feel like they have a structure and I can completely understand and appreciate that. I kind of flit between the two depending on how the mind's feeling. You know, if it feels busy, I need, uh, or busier, should I say, it's always busy. Uh, if it's busier, I would use guided because guided allows me to um, channel into something that's been focused for me. Uh, within a remit of a structure and then obviously if I'm really just going for it then I go on a couple of days silent retreat and it's it's wonderful but a couple of days for me and that's it Frankie I know that you're great and you can do a long time what's the longest silent meditation you've done uh well for me it would be going on retreats with Paul Hart so would you so they're, they're, they're only six days so they're six days and uh, I think over to San Francisco I did maybe 10 days, I'm not too sure. But, you know, it really comes down to being in the day too. So, I mean, so, some, sometimes, you know, the day itself can be very long. Uh, we'll, we'll be starting up a retreat shortly in Benburb, down to Benburb Prairie, uh, which is the back ground here. Uh, unfortunately, there's nothing happening at the moment due to COVID-19. But hopefully, you know, come September, October, we'll be back again and then we'll be on retreat. So we run two retreats a year down in Benburb, six day retreats. But really, you know, then your life becomes a retreat, doesn't it? I mean, what I love, what I love about COVID-19 is I've got this sort of almost self-imposed retreat. I, I love the idea of it being, you know, sort of it's, it's, it's put upon us regardless of whether we like it or not. And, you know, as much as everything out there that's going on is just horrific beyond comprehension, there has to be something that we can take from it, even if that is in a reflection. And I know that it sounds a bit cliched, um, but sometimes cliches are there for a reason. They, they state the obvious that's actually happening. And I think that, you know, if we can try our hardest to take something positive out of the situation, it is, it is to maybe meditate, for example, people who, that's the next question I want to ask you, is um, a couple of questions really around this. But firstly, for someone who at the moment is in lockdown, <clears throat> isn't a key worker, is at home, is finding that they're climbing the walls or they've more time in their hands or they don't know how to place themselves and they maybe want to start meditation or they're not really sure, how would you say that they should go about initiating that process? Very good. I would say, uh, so that it's good for people to know, you know, this is, again, we'll have to bow to John comes in. And to and the other great people like Jim Doty, etc. And it's they talk about the handy model of the brain. So the handy model of the brain, they take the they take the hand and we have what's called like the lower brain, the upper brain, the cortex, the prefrontal cortex, yeah, and the executive function and the executive function. So what happens in, and what we know now, you know, through neuroscience, is that you know if there's a war between the lower brain and the upper brain, the lower brain would win. And what happens is then we flip the lid. We flip the lid based upon these three guys here called the amygdala, which is a Greek word for almond, but the size of an almond. Yep. Okay. But through mindfulness practice, after like 12 hours of practice, and most people practice 20 minutes a day, and you can see the change week by week. So what happens through mindfulness practice is the cortex becomes denser. Mm -hmm. Yep. So what that means is that means is that we don't flip the lid. We don't flip the lid. So we now know through neuroscience that these guys here, the amygdala begin to swing. Mm -hmm. Now it doesn't mean to say that we're going to be stress-free, but what it means is, if you can imagine two guys in a car, right, and we're driving along, somebody cuts out in front of us, both of us will flip the lid, yeah? But this guy here will recover faster, where this guy here will then tend to perseverate. Mm -hmm. You got me? Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yep, yep. And that all comes down to this wee guy here called the amygdala. So what happens is the amygdala can be like almost like, uh, like a faulty alarm system, yeah. And what happens, you know, at times like this with COVID nineteen is the amygdala gets hijacked, and then with the hijacking of the amygdala, then we get caught up in rumination about you know what could happen, what you know, what's going to happen, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So it's good for people to know that that what happens in through our practice, you know, it's not the magical, it's not the mystical. What happens is the amygdala shrinks. Yep. Mm -hmm. And what happens is then we start to bring the mind home. Well, that's and a fantastic good, analogy. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And then, so what people, so people then sort of need to know, you know, that that's the sort of the mechanics behind it. So whenever they sit down to practice, they start then to, to bring the mind home. 
and then bringing the mind home, they start to come to their senses, sight, sound, smell, touch, taste, but most of all, they find themselves in their gut. Yep. And what I like to do with people is there's a, you know, a simple exercise which we can all practice at home, and that would be just to trace the fingers of one hand with the finger of another. Yep. Yeah. To the speed of her breath. So let her breath determine the speed of this finger. So be like, you know, like a paintbrush. Breathe it in, breathe it out. 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 And that's all our attention has to be with this finger. Breathe it in, breathe it out, breathe it in, breathe it out. And physically and do that. So you're, you're saying it's almost like a physical exercise to be able to control the breath. Very good. Okay. Very good. Very good, So, So then what happens is not only are you controlling the breath, right? Because truth be told, you can't really control the breath. No. So what actually, what actually happens is when we're in a simple exercise for a bit of a minute, right? The breath and the body connects. Yeah. So we get this sense, and, we're, and what actually takes place there, Sal, is that we move from what's called the sympathetic to the parasympathetic. Yes. Yes, so instead of being in flight or fight, you're in rest and recovery. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And that's also like, you know, being in that traffic jam and, you know, the cortisol being released and this, you know, the stressor, adrenaline and the fight or flight hormones kicking in from the adrenal glands, this kind of thing. Is this kind of what you're saying? So basically it's about your, um, the neuroscience aspect of meditation can change that chemistry in the endocrine system to allow the cortisol to be more, um, produced at a better rate so that we can kind of flit in between because we do need fight or flight cortisol right. we do. We do. which is obviously the the sympathetic nervous system um, and then the parasympathetic obviously um or this the parasympathetic and then obviously the way i would always look at it is is that rest and recovery is the beach with your pina colada in the sun to people who need an analogy and the um fight or flight is being literally stuck in traffic and you can't get out of it and that's the point it's that years ago um you know before we had cars before we had the, the amount of population that we have now you would literally be um in a in a flight or fight situation and then you could park the car or wherever or the horse and cart and you could do physical exercise which would then use up that excess adrenaline so then we can rest and recover better. But now what we do is we get into a traffic jam, we get stressed, we park our car in the car park and we go in and we sit in an office all day. So we're not exerting the excess cortisol, adrenaline. We're actually building it up further, which causes further stress down the line and essentially for a lot of people burnout, uh, which is the term used. So it's interesting that you're saying that there's neuroscience studies and research uh, dedicated to understanding that meditation you're basically saying is helping the brain to correct the way in which we deal with the stresses is that what you mean oh definitely yeah. <coughs> yeah, simple and i love your analogy there you know going from the, the traffic jam to the the beach you know and i my analogy would be like the two paddles so this paddle right is foot to the floor up goes my antennae into the fight flight and i like to add in another another two and that would be Fight, flight, freeze, and please. Yeah. Fight, flight, freeze, right. and please. Yeah. And then, as you said, that releases the adrenaline and the cortisol. Yeah. Which is okay, you know, short term, but long term is, <coughs> excuse me, it's detrimental to our well being. Right. Whereas the other paddle, right? So, through mindfulness practice, what happens is we're then able to take a foot of this paddle, right? And apply this paddle. And that would be, as you say, the, the parasympathetic dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, endorphins. All the good stuff, yep. Yeah. But you know what I love about mindfulness practice is, you I mean, sometimes you know, I would say to people, if they ask me who I am, I'd say, my name is Frank, and I'm a recovering thinker, yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because sometimes we become addicted to our thinking, and when we become addicted to our thinking, then of course we apply this paddle. Mm. So if I had, you know, my foot on this paddle with the antennae up there, mm. you know, and uh, the cortisol, you know flowing through my body. And if you were to tell me, Frankie, it's okay, take it through of that paddle, you know, we're in a safe place. It's the story in our heads. So the story in my head would be, right, I'm not safe. You got me? Yeah. You know, if I was walking down Royal Avenue and someone was walking behind me, telling me the things that I tell me, I'd phone for the police and get them lifted. <laughs> 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 so, 
And that's you so with an enlightened mind. <laughs> so, so, then, so then what happens is then through our practice, right? I know. Whatever we resist will persist. There's no doubt. Whatever we resist will persist. So through our practice, right, then we naturally go from this pedal to this pedal. And that simple exercise, you know, that's called the task at hand. And that simple exercise, yeah, what happens is the breath and the body connects. And with the, with the connection of the breath and body, we automatically go from this pedal to that pedal. And we start then to slow down. Then we start to open up. We start to let go. And if we can't let go, yeah, what happens is we're able then just to let it be. I mean, for instance, for instance, what's what's happening now in, in the world with COVID nineteen? I mean, there's some things that we cannot change, right? Yeah. So it's about it's about bringing that acceptance, and most of all, for me, I would say it's how we can fully accept ourselves. Well, exactly, because obviously we can't accept the situation or anyone else if you can't accept yourself. So it's a, it's a really good time to connect with self in order to be able to work through these things. And, you know, that's the, that's the stereotype that a lot of people will bring to meditation, which I'm sure you've heard literally thousands of times. But for those who are maybe hearing about this for the first time and finding it interesting, it's important to cover. Um, you know, this, oh, I can't clear my mind. Oh, uh, you know, I, I can't, I just can't, you know, settle down to it. My mind's racing with this, that and the other. And I find that there's almost like a sort of defense mechanism in place in that whereby without being overly judgmental to anybody because I've been there myself and I still sometimes am there. So it's, it's not that I'm fixed and you're broken. It's just more a case of um, I'm, I'm more open to the fact that that isn't the case because of my practice in meditation where I'm literally, I mean, it's not a competition, but I'm here and you're like, off the scale there in comparison but we all start somewhere I mean I'm here but I used to be there on the other side of the scale so you know and I would be a very active anyone who knows me I'm really I'm, I'm, my mom says to me you'll be having breakfast you'll be thinking about what you're having for lunch if you're having lunch you're thinking about what you're having for dinner and you apply that modality to every aspect of your life I'm always chasing the next thing rather than actually really immersing myself in what's going on in the present moment and I'm, I'm becoming much more able to allow myself to feel that without guilt and that would be a lot of people's um problem would be uh the feel guilty to relax and rest you know it's, it's that kind of thing where if someone has a lie down in the afternoon they feel bad because society you know, doesn't allow you to have a rest in the afternoon yeah. Um, you know, we pulled a short straw when we didn't get a siesta as part of our day, but that's another story. But when it comes to uh, the meditation aspect of things, I often would say to people, and I'm not an expert, I would say it's not about clearing the mind. It's not about getting to a place where you are mindless. It's mindfulness. So can you explain a wee bit about that for people in order to un make, make it more understanding? Very good. Very good. Very good. Thank you very much. I would say, you know, you can't have a cup of tea without tea leaves. Mm -hmm. And you can't have a mind without thoughts. Good. I mean, so whenever we look up at the sky and we see the clouds, but the clouds are not the sky because we go up on a plane through the clouds, we've got a clear blue sky. So mindfulness practice then has a way <clears throat> for me, and especially this time, especially this time, you know, to take care of ourselves I would say on the planet today, it's one of the one of the, the top sort of uh, interventions for self care. I mean, you know, if you're on an airplane and the cabin crew says, "In the event of the plane going down, you know, down comes the mask. You put the mask on here first, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and then you tend to the other passengers." So for me, my, my mindfulness practice is to be able to put that mask on. You know, in the morning time, I have a daily morning practice in the morning time, and then that again takes the fruit of this battle applies this paddle. You know, mindfulness, you know, it's got different names for Patsana, Shikantanzi, Shamata, Soto, Rinzai, and a host of others, but they all mean the same thing, and that's insight. So through practicing what happens is, I call it the art of falling awake. So we become awake, we become aware, we become alert, we become alive, mm. and most of all, we become authentic. Yeah, we become authentic. Well, yeah, and obviously everyone, well, I, I would hope that everyone would want to to be authentic and, and be real because to me that's like the number one fundamental principle of existence i mean if you're not real why are we here very very good yeah. and like so remember i said fight flight freeze or please that yeah. last one the, the pleasing one i mean so the pleasing one is you know 
when we're not being authentic, where I feel as if I need to please Tom, Dick and Harry and so on and so forth. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, that sense of being rejected or abandoned. I mean, you know, if I don't please you, you're not like me. And if you don't like me, my world will yeah. come up. Yeah. yeah. So then through mindfulness practice, what a lot of people tell me is, you know, uh, and there's a lovely story I'd like to tell you of a young woman at yep. the age of 10 uh, down in, I, I, I can't remember the name of the school. Uh, it was just outside Newry. I think it's called Unlure. But anyway, so this, what happens, I went down to the school. I was doing the work with these, these young children, uh, P5 or P6. And I, I did a, a six-week program. And they had a great teacher in the, in the classroom. And whenever I was there, the teacher did a practice every day. You know, so on week one, he would continue with the practice every day with the kids in the class. So he made sure that, that they got, you know, open to the practice. So whenever I went to the class first, I asked, does anybody know what mindfulness is? And nobody knew. So these guys are like eight or nine. Then I asked, does anybody know what stress is? And they all put their hands up. Mm -hmm. Anyway, after the six week program and a few months later, Robbie Meredith from the BDC wanted to do a program on mindfulness in schools. So we went back down to that school and he asked the question to the class, does anybody know what mindfulness is? Yep. And they all put their hands up. But I remember this young woman, about, about 10 years of age, and she said she lived up the mountainside, and where she lived, sometimes she didn't get a signal for her phone, right? Okay. But if she switched it off and reconnected again, she got a signal. Okay. And I think, you know, and that was like some years ago, I think from then to now, you know, she got it right. So it's something about then through our practice, right? You know, we're able then to unplug. And through our unplugging, we're able then to recharge. That's right. Really go back to yeah. go back to those different schools. You know, what happens is we develop insight. Mm -hmm. So you intuitively know what to do and you intuitively know how to do it. So there's something about, and you mentioned earlier on, know about going from fight, flight, freeze, or freeze into rest and digest. So it's something about that gut feeling, that about being able to be in our gut, you know, and, uh, and then just to know exactly that the most important thing is to find out what the most important thing is, which is this moment. This moment, which has never happened before. That's right. And it's so hard for people to get their head around that concept. I mean, I totally resonate with that way of thinking. Uh, I'm trying you not know, to, well, I should say I shouldn't try, but I'm connecting more with the, the, the feeling of, of being rather than doing, because we are human beings, not human doings. So, you know, that's obviously something that you've, I'm sure, taught many, many people. Um, it's just it's so interesting. I, I literally could talk all day long about this. This is, just, this is just brilliant. What was your first experience of meditation like? Uh, I remember it was a Tibetan, uh, Tibetan, a great, great Tibetan Lama teacher, and his name was uh, Panchen Mukta uh, a very good friend of his holiness, the Dalai Lama. And I remember, I remember, you know, he he read me very well, right? Uh, and this is a way, way back, a way, way back. And I remember that uh, he told me to practice for five minutes, right? And I felt as if I was the dunce, do you know what I mean? I felt as if, what do you mean five minutes? You know, now I want to sit, you know, forever. So, so I mean, no, no, that, you know, like it was like baby steps, you know, like five minutes, five minutes, five minutes. And I remember whenever I, I sat for that five minutes, you know, with him, uh, uh, down in a place called Owen Doing, just over the border, uh, County Kevin. And I remember whenever I sat with him, that, you know, suddenly, for the first time in my life, I discovered that switch. You know, where I was able to sort of flick the switch and then suddenly, you know, I would have a PhD in reacting. <laughs> I become like, you know what I mean? I become like a nuclear reactor. Yeah. But I discovered a switch where I was able to, if I could flick that switch and go up there, I could also flick the switch and come back down again. Mm -hmm. And I would say that that's what he taught me within, you know, my first session with him was uh, being able to, as I said before, it's about being able to let go. It's about letting go, right? of what I'm holding on to. Yeah. So it's not yeah, other people. are yeah. so much in fear though, you know, there, there's so much fear around letting go um, because people are afraid of what they might find or they're afraid that they're going to lose control. So, you know, it's difficult for a lot of people to just let go. And, you know, I'm not undermining what it is that you're saying. I think it's, you know, fantastic that you mm -hmm. had such a connection so early on in your, in your practice. 
Um, for somebody who, like myself, okay, so I'm asking your advice for myself along with many others, people who've dabbled in meditation, who really, really get it and understand the principle behind what it allows and what you can achieve from it. How can you bring it that little bit further? You know, where, okay, I'll explain. So this morning I was doing a Deepak Chopra meditation about uh, compassion. And I think it's really important at the minute, especially we can talk about that soon about compassion, but it was all about um, looking for your inner, inner strength in order to be more compassionate to yourself and to others regardless of what's going on. And I, for example, um, it says, you know, connect to the inner self on, on that basis. Now, I would say I'm a pretty compassionate person. We all have work to do. There are areas absolutely um, that I, like anyone else, can work on. But I kind of felt like I had that one nailed. So I, I was sitting there almost, you know, yesterday was a bigger challenge. It was about self-trust. You know, and I really had to, you know, work on that one yesterday. I felt like, yeah, this is a challenge for me. Mm -hmm. Whereas today, with regards to the compassion um, intention, um, I felt like, you know, not in a cocky way, as in, oh yeah, I, 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 I'm compassionate. I don't need to do this today. But it's just more about, you know, finally tuning it to get something out of it. I didn't get as much out of today's practice as I did from yesterday's practice. Is is that because? And um, there was more of a need yesterday. I think, to be honest, Sal, I think it's about, you know, where we are now. Mm -hmm. I mean, like yesterday's yesterday, uh, you know, and for me, when it comes to compassion, you know, if compassion does not include ourselves, it's not compassion. Well, that's exactly what he was saying. You know, yeah. he, he absolutely 100%, you know, yeah. and that, that's what leads me on to talking about a, bit of, a wee bit about COVID-19 coronavirus that's obviously highly prevalent at the moment. And this, this notion of um, the key workers and just to touch on it briefly, you know, their literal compassion and the compassion that they have for their patients, the compassion they have for each other working in that environment, and then the compassion we have as a nation to, for them and also you know clapping is one thing um you know as a, a without making it into a joke I, I got a little text this morning only 35 more claps to christmas you know and you know it's got it's it's got a bittersweet um you know feeling to it uh, but you know i don't know about you but the week goes in and then it's thursday oh, no. again and oh, then no. the week goes in and it's thursday again and yeah. You know, it's eight o'clock and, and we do our bit. Now I'm doing my bit because I mean, ultra sensible in, in staying in and doing lockdown and ticking all the boxes correctly with regards to, you know, limiting um, the spread of the virus through real intense social distancing. Um, but the compassion part of things is so important. Um, and what, what I feel at the moment is, is that um, I don't think that people aren't compassionate. I think that society is set up in such a way in order for us not to be able to do the things that we actually want to be able to do, which is be compassionate. And I think that what we're doing at the moment is seeing a shift in, um, in what's really important, but also people haven't just become compassionate overnight. You know, it's as if we've always had it in us, but there has been a certain amount of limitation placed upon us in order for us not to be able to express that regularly. Do you agree with that? I agree with it entirely. So do you. And, uh, and to be honest, you know, I think we were, as you say, we were designed to be compassionate because otherwise we would have been born with big nails and big teeth. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So yeah. we, we, are, we are definitely born to be, to be kind and compassionate. And then when you look at the great people at the forefront, the nurses especially, you know, and when we look at compassion, you know, for me, then that compassion is about, you know, forgetting ourselves. I mean, that's it. For me, that's the heart of practice. So it's about forgetting ourselves and they're going into the cold face, you mean, or in this case, the COVID 19 face. I mean, and all they're asking us to do is to stay home, right? No. Just to, to stay home. So actually, you know, staying home can be also an act of compassion. Go back to my good friend, my very close friend, uh, Professor Jim Doty, based in Stanford University. He would say that if mindfulness is the flower, 
compassion. Compassion is the fragrance. You know, no. if mindfulness is if mindfulness is the candle, then compassion is the flame. Mm. So whenever we begin to practice, right? You know, this harsh internal, you know, saboteur that can sort of like say we're not good enough, or you know, you can't practice it, should be different, and the frustrations and so on and so forth. I mean, that internal dialogue, that narrative changes to a softer, kinder, gentler, you know, more compassionate voice. So that's where it all begins. It begins with, you know, can we be compassionate towards ourselves? Can I be? You know, John Cabot would say that mindfulness practice is a particular way of paying attention to what's happening right here, right now, in a non judgmental way. In a non judgmental way. Yeah. So for me, whenever I, whenever I sit down to practice, it's about, you know, the thoughts that, you know, how long is this going to go on for? This should be different. You know, this is not as good as yesterday or whatever, right? You know, what happens is, you know, that judgmentalism starts to melt away like snow the ditch. Sounds good. Oh, it is. That's what, that's what I do. You know what I mean? I mean, my practice to me, you know, is uh, everything. You know, my practice to me is, it's like, you know, if I was sewing the parachute, you know what I mean? Yeah. You've got to sew your, you've got to sew your parachute every day because you can't sew your parachute when you're falling. You know so that's my, my daily practice is I'm frankly a soul that that part of shit. Yeah. Well, I think I think it's fantastic, but there's bound to be days that you know you're just not digging it and you're not connecting the way that you would like to. And is, are you basically saying let it go and don't be so frustrated at the fact that that can happen? What I'm saying is go back. Remember the two guys in the car? Yeah. Right. So the two guys in the car, somebody, you know, cuts out in front of them, both of them flip the lid. Yeah. Yeah. This guy here, this guy recovers faster. This guy here's going on like two weeks later. Did you hear what happened to us? We could have been written off, but he had no license. In fact, he was drinking, whatever. This guy here's recovered. So what happens is, you know, I mean, you know, we recover faster. I mean, so I'm not saying I'm not saying that one is stress free or whatever. No. But it's we don't get caught up. We don't take the bit. You know, you know, for me, there's a thing called a, a it's called a dopamine spritzer. A guy called Professor Judd Brewer talks about it in UCSD, you know, and that is we can be. Remember, I said my name is Frank and recovered thinker. Mm. We can become addicted, right, to the news. Do you know what I mean? Oh yeah, I don't, but yeah. Yeah, we become addicted to our cell phones. I mean, so I need, you know, what's that message? What's up the now? I need to go on the Amazon. I need to go on the Facebook. Do you mean? Oh, like remember you said thirty-five traps of Christmas. You know, like. I've only got 35, you know, hits today on uh, on Facebook. And, yeah. you know, that's another addiction. I know it is. It's you massive. Know. And we're all part of it, though. This is the thing. It's like we're part of a construct that we know is actually really, really damaging, yes. you know, in the sense of how it's being used. You know, it, it's the sort of thing where, you know, you pay for Netflix, which is a subscription. Uh, it's not abused. Yes. You know, we don't pay for Facebook. It's abused. It does have its purpose and it does, yeah. there's times in which I find when I'm doubting the whole concept of it, I um, something happens and I think I'm really glad that I used that platform because I got a lot out of that particular thing. Um, yes. But then a lot of the time you just think this is toxic. Yes. And I love, you know that, that great uh, street artist Banksy? <coughs> Banksy had this great, great piece of art and it was like this guy was in a, in a prison right in a cell right and the bars on the window were like a cell phone that was the reflection that shot under the ground so it was like we become prisoners of the cell phone oh I know. oh cell phone yes my Captain. goodness wow i never looked at it like that before uh-huh. that explains a lot <laughs> you know what I mean? so, <laughs> well i love, I love fancy for that but also then you know it's about it is about that attachment and it's about that that addiction and it's about you know that wanting more. So then, when we look at the likes of the, the beautiful nurses, whatever today, you know, you know, it's that unselfish act, right? Because the truth be told, the addiction, most of all, is an addiction to yourself that doesn't exist. Well, exactly. It's a um, it's a modified ego, isn't it? Whereas you know the the nurses, they're egoless. You know, they, they leave their ego at the door, um, and they get on with what it is that they need to get on on with, but. 
you know, the, the likes and the ticks and the dopamine hits and spritzers that you talk about, it's all about feeding the ego, which doesn't exist. I mean, it, it does and it doesn't, but it's misused, if you know what I mean. And that's, yeah, and as a great nutritionist like yourself, you would know too, that's just like taking a spoonful of sugar, is that right? Uh, yeah. and pretty pretty instant gratification yes. and an instant hit with no sustainable outcome that's right you know so whenever we look at the at the, at the you know all the frontline people you know not forgetting you i mean the guy who's cleaning the street today i mean absolutely you know in, in the town now you've got you know police officers around you know around the waterworks you know making sure about social distancing or whatever i mean there's lots of and the guys in the shops i mean uh, so there's so many people doing so much work. I mean, and all they're asking us to do is to stay home. I know that. And it, it's the sort of thing that um, it's something that's so simple to many, but so complicated to others. But it all depends on the mindset and whether you've ants in your pants or whether you're perfectly content in your environment and space in order to be able to do the betterment for society. And that's essentially what we're doing. And I want to look back on this knowing that I've done everything that I can to contribute to the outcome, which is going to hopefully start to get better soon. And it's beautiful too, but you know, I, I like, I, I think I've seen a, I think I've seen an advertisement, an advertisement from like Romania, where there's this young woman that's just wearing a, no, a mask, right? And then the story goes, I'm wearing this mask to protect you from me. Yeah. And that's what we've been like, again, like mindfulness practice. So mindfulness practice is, I mean, that, you know, I'm protecting me from you. You got me? And um, vice versa. Yeah, because obviously if you're working on yourself, you're going to be a better person and communicate with them in a better way. And if you can't love someone, at least don't hurt them. Well, exactly. You know, and these, are, these are trying times, you mean, for, for families. I mean, and I think of families, you know, you know uh, maybe you know, caught up in, in some small apartment with a few children or whatever, you know, and uh, and don't forget, you know, re regarding sort of the difficulties that we have today too, with food banks, etc. You know, what I've seen come out of this year, you know, my exercises are great every day for a cycle. And I know this to be true. And that is that in Belfast City Centre, there are no rough sleepers. That's, That's so gone. I, 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 well, yeah. I know, uh, you know, it, but it, it is good to get your exercise. That's one other thing I wanted to talk about and just touch on. Um, yeah you know, about getting the vitamin D and even if you can't get vitamin D, you know, just to try and take a supplement of vitamin D in a sublingual spray form. It's the most bioavailable and cellularly available to the body rather than being ingested through the stomach. Uh, it's a bit like vitamin C or vitamin D hitting your arm from the sunshine, vitamin D in a spray hitting you on a cellular level. So it is the best way to get it. But whenever you're out on your bike, Frankie, get those sleeves rolled up because that's where the vitamin D is going to go in. Start, starting the day. Yes. So also, um, you know, now that we've talked a bit about, you know, being in the mind and about being in the present and about being in the house, what are you looking forward to out there when these things start to settle down? Is there a particular restaurant um, that you like to go to? Bowtree. Oh, yeah. Bowtree, uh, University, University Street. Love uh, it. Yes. Yeah, Thai I, food is my favourite food in the world. And here, I mean, my friend comes over from San Francisco, Paul, and he's, you know, he, he's down in Thailand, and he says it is the best Thai food in Belfast. Wow, I, know, I would agree, because, I mean, I'm not going to go through and name all the other restaurants to put them down, because, they, they, you know, they are good within their own right, but yeah. uh, uh, Bow Tree by far. But you know that's because the lady who owns it, her husband is Thai, so, you know, they're coming at it from a really kind of a fusion point of view of, you know... Oh, yes. You know, and that that's what's so good about it. It's so good. I absolutely love it. I really miss it as well. I can't wait to get back there. Maybe we should go there for something to eat whenever this is all over. It sounds good. Right away. That's a date. That's yeah. a great date. Yeah. And what about visiting? Where would you like to, you know, if you had, obviously we can't travel at the moment unless it's really, really, really crucial um, or an emergency situation. Where are you going to go in the world next? Where is your next destination of somewhere that you might like to visit? Oh, I'm due over in uh, San Francisco. Okay. Uh, but I'm due over there. But if you were asking me where would I like to go, yeah, and I probably wouldn't go there now because of the lockdown, and that's Japan. Japan. Have you ever been to Japan? Never been in Japan. Wow. I, I would love to go myself, yeah. yeah. But I have a friend who goes over every year, 
and uh, I must admit, you know, I'm not a big fan of looking at people's photographs of their holidays, <laughs> but I love his I love his pictures. I mean, yeah. I would actually ask him. I would say, I would say to him when he comes back, I would say, you know, and have you any any photographs? And you know, he goes over there to at the cherry blossom time, which is a holiday time for oh, the, the, the that's Japanese. April, isn't it? And it is, yes, yeah, 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 it's yeah. now. It's now. Yeah. Um, also, I wanted to ask you about uh, this big conference, if you don't mind, yes. coming up. Uh, it's it's it was meant to be in two parts, wasn't it? It was meant to be right. May and October. Would that be correct? That's right. Yeah. yeah. But, but now, unfortunately, unfortunately, due to COVID nineteen, uh, we've now shifted, pushed it back to. Well, the good news is it's pushed back to April of next year, uh, and rather than being separate, they're both, they're both going to be together. It'll be over like four to five days. So the first two days will be in Queen's University. We're going to bring 400 neuroscientists from around the world. Uh, and we're going to sort of like descend on Belfast. And this will be the first time in Europe. And they're going to be coming to Belfast. That's amazing. And what we're going to be looking at, we're going to be looking at the neuroscience of compassion. Yep, the neuroscience of compassion. Uh, and this will be under the sort of the guidance of my buddy, uh, a great man called Jim Doty, based in, in Stanford. So that'll be two days in Queen's. So that'll be the academic side of things. And then the other two and a half days will be uh, in the city. So what's going to happen is we're going to have a great man called uh, Tim Chapman, and he'll be looking at restorative justice. Up at, and we're going to be using the uh, the criminal jail as a venue there. The Belfast Mac, we're going to have the use of the Belfast Mac for theatre and also for the show, uh, a movie or two, you know, on the loop, and with, with lots of art as well being shown. We're going to be looking at, at addiction, you know, pretty big as well. We're going to be looking at an addiction. And, uh, and then it's going to end on day one with a concert. Yeah. Then day, so then the second day of, uh, of the festival will be an interfaith forum. So again, you know, Hindu, Sikh, Muslim, Jew, Christian, etc. We'll all then sort of meet together and then be able then to, to explore through a compassionate conversation. You know, I bring about a sense of well-being. And here, no better time, you know, in, in, and especially coming out of COVID-19, you know, in, and, and obviously what you had just said there too, is that, you know, the, the compassionate acts that we've seen, you know, you know every day. I mean, well, yeah, well, there's, there's no religious divide of compassion. No. You know, it, it's the thing that runs through every single religion. Uh, is true. compassion. Um, you know, it's, it's shown in the Bible. You know, it, it's that kind of... Um, you know, do unto others what you would want to be done to yourself and also not what you want to be done to yourself. So it's, you know, very much a yep. of, uh, compassion is a, is a recurring underlying theme throughout all theology or daily beliefs. You don't have to. That's another thing. You don't even need to be religious to have compassion. You have compassion and that's it. And it's almost like a default, isn't it? I mean, you can practice getting in tune more with your compassion, but you know, it, it, it ha and to become like tapping into your own availability of compassion rather than in search of something out there. It's you're obviously searching for something that already pre exists, isn't that right? Very good. And you know, and I know too. So if you don't go within, you go without. <laughs> That's right. I know so many people are out there looking for answers, and if only they realize that it's free yeah. and all in here um, would be a better place, wouldn't it? I have another beautiful friend called Naomi Shihab Nye, and Naomi Shihab Nye, you know, had, uh, had written a beautiful poem, which I'd recommend people to read, and the poem is called Kindness, yeah. And what I love about, about that poem, what I love about kindness is, you know, I know, and we all know what kindness is. You know, whether it be I'm driving along the road to go onto the motorway, and somebody gives me a license to go on the slip road, you mean, or, I mean, while I'm in a shop, and then someone says, you know, you only have a couple of items, you know, go ahead, right? Yeah, I mean, these, these acts of kindness. I mean, I read away without thinking. I thanked them right away. You know? Of course, and I don't even, I don't even right. question. I don't even turn and say, "I wonder why this person let me go first, Right? Yeah. I mean, right away. You know, deep down inside, you know, I know what kindness is. You know what kindness is, and we all know what kindness is. So it's about, about you know, the shift to me when it comes to compassion. It's about you know, just being kind. Exactly. Well, yeah. well, well, a good analogy of, of that as well is um, when we're talking about kindness is if you're driving down the road, say we'll use that because we're talking like that, um, you know, a far distant thought driving, <laughs> but driving down the road and uh, someone um, doesn't let you out. Yes. 
then your attitude, people say that their attitudes change and alter the whole day in the sense that then you don't let somebody out and then they don't let somebody out and then you don't let somebody out. Whereas if you are in a shopping center and you do happen to let somebody past you or whatever, um, apparently statistics show that something like a hundred acts of kindness can happen in that day due to the act of kindness that you have brought to that person because it's contagious a good contagion (laughs) oh yes a great contagion i like that one yes a great contagion and equally you know you know in the car on the motorway whenever someone lets you out you know again you can find that further down the road you let somebody out and they'll let somebody out do you mean so it's that sort of you know, again, that, that contagion, I like that, that sense of using the word contagion. But it's, you know, for me, it's about, you know, that's what our life's all about. How can I be kinder? But remember again, you know, I go back to like, if compassion is not for ourselves, it's not compassion. And then for me, you know, if kindness does not include myself, then it's not kindness. Well, that's right. And I think as well as that, um, you're almost on a, a path of, self-destruction and demise when you are faced with a situation you know you get up one morning and something happens you know something silly that doesn't particularly uh you know suit your way of thinking and then all of a sudden the next thing happens oh i'm not having a great day here you know and you're 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 literally going into and it's very easy like i'm not sitting here really criticizing and ridiculing other people for thinking like that we've all been there and we will continue to be there on times because we're all human uh, but at the same time, it's interesting how you know it can you can go down a downward spiral of negativity and um, doubt and annoyance. But if one thing happens, it can have a, a like a ricochet um, effect, like a domino effect on on your day. And it's about trying to turn that around to not let your thought pattern um, dictate the rest of your day, and how we can try. Mm-hmm and pull it back in such a way in order to, because there's been days that's happened as well. I'm sure you can agree with that, where you think that was my attitude. I changed that around. I was able to do that just by saying, no, I am not going to let this day be ruined just because something didn't go my way. Brilliant. You know, my teacher's teacher is a great man called Shun Suzuki Roshi, who wrote a fantastic book called Beginner's Mind. You know, and what they say, they say that in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities in the expert's mind there are a few yes you know, so it's like begin again begin again and there's a great Irish poet called Brendan Keneally who wrote a fantastic poem about begin again and maybe at the end of the session we'll be able to read it or you know refer people to to this beautiful poem yes and let's really, do that. Well, let's do it at the end yeah I think I have a poetry book here in the room mm-hmm. Good. I know because my mum, she used to teach in Queens as well and um, in the social science department. And in the, um, in the staff room on the wall, it said, you know, amongst philosophers, you know, amongst academics, uh, amongst real intellectuals. And on the wall, it said, the more you read, the less you know. Is that a truth there? <laughs> I suppose there's a certain amount of reading you can do, but at the same time, it's about feeling and understanding the self. But you can refer to great um, philosophers and, and, and insights into different people at the same time. You know, it's getting the balance, I suppose. You know, I remember my mum saying to me when I went to university, she says, go and enjoy it. She says, it's an education in life, not an education in education. And uh, my what a mom, great mommy. well, my mum is a doctor of philosophy, but I don't think that her title gave her that philosophy. The philosophy was already there before the title, uh, hence the title. But um, she she believed that, and I at twenty didn't understand that. I had an idea of what she meant, but obviously hindsight's a wonderful thing and experience. And of course, now I completely understand. Like I completely understand what she meant by that. And. You know that's also really important um but also um yeah um i was thinking about songs that's one thing i've been i've been thinking about um songs like because you and i have a very very strong love for Joni mitchell that's true and just to lighten up the conversation a bit uh, and get thinking about some music um what would you say your three favorite songs are 
Well, another one is my good friend and yours, Van de Man, and uh, it would have to be, would have to be, uh, it's not particularly one song. Do you mean? I do love, I do love Astro Weeks, but I do love No Jury, No Method, No Teacher. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I love that. I've come across another beautiful band, and they're called the Lake Poets. The Lake Poets. No, Lake, as in L A K E. Yeah, okay. the Lake Poets. Yeah, I think they're a Scottish band. And the track that I came across first was uh, by them. It's called Shipyard. Shipyard. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And our very own. Oh, God, there's so many. I mean, there's uh, there's a great one called Sal Hamby and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> go to Spotify, folks. Go to Spotify. Check it out. Foy yeah. Vance, Foy Vance, Vance, another yeah. one, the joy, the joy of Nothing. Yeah. Uh, the Villagers, The Villagers, another great Oh, band. I know, I know, they're great. They're great. And the list goes on and on and on. I know, I know. Um, well, uh, is there any message that you'd like to sort of give to people um, just to, when we're rounding up here about uh, what people can be doing at the moment um, in the now for themselves and for others? I know it's a big question. But... So first of all, you know, what I was told, and I believe it to be true, and that is, you know, I was told by a great man that I had two lives. And of course, being from Belfast, I wanted to know when to get my second life. <laughs> and, he and he told me, he says, you get your second life when you realise you've only one. Yeah. So I'd like to say to people, you know, I mean, that this is your life. I mean, and, uh, and to take care and to stay connected. I mean, that's very, very healthy. I mean, and, and to do something you know, at least once a day, you know, for someone else. You know, I know Maxim would be constant thought of others. I remember another great teacher of mine based in New York City, and I was sort of playing with this idea about, about humility, and I wanted to know what humility was. And he said that humility was not thinking any less of yourself, but just thinking a bit more about others. You know? Just thinking a bit more about others. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for, for, the, for the viewer, for the listener, I would say, you know, just for today, just for today, you know, be a bit kinder, a bit softer, a bit gentler, you know, towards ourselves. Mm -hmm. And then forget about the other, because what happens, it'll naturally take That's place. very true. That's very yeah. true. It will resonate and it will amplify uh, accordingly. Um, I, I was just wanting, before we read this poem, Frankie, Yes. Um, there's one thing that I find really interesting at the minute. I don't know if you see it. Well, I think you probably do. Um, we always would have put at the end of text messages, take care, you know, until the next time, take care, take care. And it seems to have been massively replaced now with stay well, stay safe. Brilliant. And I'm thinking that that's probably going to be replaced for quite some time, if not become the new norm, um, prefix at the end of a text message, taking care, uh, being replaced with staying safe. It's funny because they both mean the same thing. Yes. But one has replaced the other significantly in, in these current times. It's just interesting. It's just an interesting thought that maybe that will become the new take care going forward. And so that's what you've always been doing. I mean, you've always been doing, as you know, stay well, promote well-being. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm glad now, you know, I like, I like also, I uh, know Russell Brand. I like Russell. I you know, love who, Russell Brand. So Russell was supposed to be over with us about, about, I think it was about two years ago now, but unfortunately his mum had an accident. But hopefully mm -hmm. Russell, if free, will be with us then next April for the conference, right? Fantastic. But Russell was saying that what he would like to do, you know, no way we have signs now rather than shaking hands and people bump arms or whatever it is, right? But he has one which I think I love the bits, and that is, you know, as a greeting, it's like, no, lockdown, you know? So <laughs> yeah. this, is, this is the way. So it's like, it's being innovative and it's being creative, you mean, and there's so many. Because I like what you said too, the new norm, do you mean? Yes. So we're going to the new norm. So this new norm to me is a blank canvas. So we're able then to, you know, you know, create a new Belfast. A new you construct, know, yeah. A new construct, yes. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's great, yes, because I get those messages too. Stay well, stay connected, and so on. And I, and I love it when I hear, you know, people are to it. Stay well, stay connected, stay home, or stay whatever. Safe. Stay safe. I mean, and I hear them, right? And it's a great reminder. 
it is a great reminder but i just i i find that this this take you know because i always would quite often say take care but i find i'm replacing it with stay safe stay well keep well and it's, it's just funny because they all really do mean the same thing <laughs> yeah yeah but i think there's something about it too then uh you know so you know that we have this great meaning and you know this program is right now that sort of sense of purpose and that sense of meaning it's great meaning and it's great purpose and we really mean for you to stay safe you know what i mean people need to stay safe and then as what we need to do is we need to take care of ourselves to stay safe to take care of others that they stay safe too and be kind to ourselves and then in turn we will be kinder to others do you want to read that poem give me one moment just so happens give me a moment now please and uh, I prepared earlier i know this is the beautiful poem it's called begin by brendan keneally Begin again to the summoning birds, to the sight of light at the window. Begin to the lure of the morning traffic all along the Lisburn Road. Every beginning is a promise, born in light and dying in dark. Determination and exaltation of springtime flowering the way to work. Begin to the pageant of queuing girls, the arrogant loneliness of swans in the canal. Bridges linking the past and future old friends passing the with us still. Begin to the loneliness that cannot end, since it perhaps is what makes us begin. Begin to wonder at unknown faces, at crying birds in the sudden rain, at branches stark in the willing sunlight, at seagulls foraging for bread, at couples sharing a sunny secret, alone together while making good. Though we live in a world that dreams of ending, that always seems about to give in, something that will not acknowledge conclusion, insists that we forever begin. Well, I'm going to smile because if I don't, I, I literally have a tear in my eye. Just That's just beautiful. And it's just such a sentiment to end on. I really, really appreciate you coming on to my podcast, Frankie, In Search of Purpose. And I think today a lot of people will get a lot of purposeful information out of what you have given. I really appreciate it and have a great day. Thank you. And you too. Stay safe. <laughs> Stay safe and take care. Take care.